Okay. <laughs> right. We're okay. recording. Okay. So, um, brilliant. Participant 16, waiting room. I'm now going to admit all. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, we'll just give it another couple of minutes before we start. Um, hopefully, you can all see my screen. And please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat while we just wait and for a few people more to join. We've got 17 participants at the moment, and we do have over 60 books booked, so we do need to give it a couple of minutes. We seem to have quite a lot of noise going on. Um, could you all please mute your microphones? I think it's someone called Abby. I can see your the sound going up and down on yours. So if you could please all mute. Actually, I can mute you all. Um, So we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Please introduce yourselves in the chat. Always interesting to know who we've got and where you're from and what your interests are. And we'll start in a few moments. Ooh, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. okay. I'm not sure whether you're Saim Networks or whether I'm Saim Networks. I think we both are actually. I think we're both logged into the same one. Doesn't matter though, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just wondered whether there was anyone else. Um, Okay, so we've got a couple of people putting things in the chat. That's great. Um, hi, Anna from Anglia, Anglia, Anglia Ruskin. So, two students. Um, two, we are still um, recording, are we? If, who, how many are students and how many are members and how many are non-members? Maybe Drew's gone now. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, I missed the question. I said, <laughs> oh, it looks like we've got at least three students. Yeah, yeah, chat. we've got a, few, a mixture yet. Yeah, we've got some student members, we've got some sign members, and a couple of non members as well, I think, on this one. Great. It's always useful to have the stats sent to me for, um, for the case of um, you know, the analysis. Yeah, absolutely. We do afterwards. No, and we are recording it's... just to let everyone know. And we are well, we seem to be sticking on 17 participants, but just bear with us for another couple of minutes. It's always very difficult. We've discussed at various times how we ought to have sort of music playing while while people join and that kind of thing. And <laughs> Maybe you could provide us some nice bird song, actually, Amy. That that might be sweet. What we were thinking of, uh, you know, atmospheric curlews over, um, yeah, on the coast. Oh, that would be lovely if I had some available. I'm not sure I've got any saved here though, but that would be nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's the, it's the awkward, I, this happens in every meeting, the, the slight awkwardness where you kind of think, oh, we've got all those people booked and we really uh, want to give people the opportunity to join. But at the same time, people who have joined on time, we don't want to penalise you. Um, so one more minute, we'll start at um, 
at five past. So we've got someone from the Records Centre, that's always good. Okay. All right, well, my, um, my time says five past, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to um, Dr. Amy Liedell, who is a behavioural ecologist who's been working particularly with acoustic um, recording. Now, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and, and I'll be monitoring the chat and um, I will have um, questions and discussion after Amy's presentation. So um, that's great, Amy. Over to you. I'm going to um, mute. Thank you for inviting me uh, to talk this evening and thank you everyone uh, for joining. Uh, I hope you can all um, see my screen okay. Uh, um, yes, I'm a behavioural ecologist primarily, I'm a lecturer at Liverpool Hope University and I'm going to talk to you about some work that I've done about measuring acoustic similarity, mostly within populations but it can also be applied to between populations as well and it'll be interesting to have some discussion afterwards on how this can be applied to different uh, systems um, and different um, types of, of monitoring and really just think about some sort of uh, recent advances in the field of acoustics as well. So I hope I don't need to convince you that acoustic monitoring is widespread in ecology and it's used in lots and lots of different ways um, as, as ecologists. So we have species specific monitoring, which is, is mostly what I'll talk about. But we have um, acoustics which are used for measuring uh, biodiversity across uh, tropical forests, for example, passive acoustic devices uh, uh, measuring um, amounts of biodiversity in certain areas. And more recently, we can even use acoustic data to look at geographical processes. So things like rock fractures and, and patterns in rainfall um, can also be assessed using acoustic data as well. And finally, we can even use acoustic data to look at things like detecting illegal processes like logging um, in protected areas, for example. So today, we're, the discussion is really focused on species specific monitoring or, or bioacoustics. And mostly I'm going to be talking about birds, which is my study system and what I've worked with most uh, closely. So, so not these birds, but this is a nice example um, of, of a study that came out a couple of years ago that showed um, that um, by measuring acoustic data of songbirds in Sabah um, actually revealed um, population shifts in these breeding populations of songbirds in line or in response to increased logging activity in these tropical forests. So just a really nice example of how acoustic data to, can be used to monitor um, breeding populations, particularly in response to sort of, of land use change and that kind of thing. Um, but I know not everyone here is, is ornithologists and, and you'll be working on lots of different systems. So, of course, bioacoustics is really, really um, uh, widely used in other systems as well, particularly bats, um, but also um, amphibians as well. So there's been lots of works work on frogs and toads and also insects as well, particularly um, <clears throat> crickets and, and grasshoppers. So it's really widespread across the animal kingdom as well. So I thought I'd just start or continue this introduction by just giving some basics of bioacoustics. Some of you may be very familiar with bioacoustics, others may, may be quite new to it. So really, we're just talking about analysing um, biological sounds, and we do this using sonograms. So you can see a nice, simple illustration of a sonogram here of a chaffinch. I have got a recording. I don't know if it'll... I'm not sure if, if you guys heard that, but you've probably already heard a chaffinch before anyway. This is what it looks like in a sonogram. So animal sounds are hierarchical. You have these basic units which are called elements. Elements make up syllables, syllables make up phrases, and then phrases make up the overall uh, signal um, or, or sound. 
And if we compare the sonogram of a chaffinch, for example, to the sonogram of a great tit, again, I've got the sound here. Perhaps you can hear that, perhaps you can't. So the sound of a great tit there. And if we can already see looking at the sonogram that there's clear differences between these two songs. But how do we actually quantify this, this uh, dissimilarity, if you like, so similarity or dissimilarity between these two species? And what if we wanted to look at more subtle differences? So not just differences between species, but what about differences between populations of the same species? So asking questions about sort of local adaptation and that kind of thing. Or we might also want to look at differences within populations between different individuals within a population. So as you can imagine, we might need to have some, some more sort of um, detailed techniques in order to be able to do this. <clears throat> so one approach that is quite widely used and that has been used is to do multivariate analyses. So you can take various parameters of the sound and measure the differences between those specific parameters that you've selected. So something like maximum frequency or the call or, or sound duration, for example, you can isolate those and, and just calculate the difference between them. But there's loads and loads of different parameters that you could choose. So how do you even know where to start with deciding which of these parameters is important and which of which aren't as particularly important, perhaps? The second thing to ask is whether it's even biologically meaningful to isolate parameters like that. If you think about how animals actually use these sounds, is it, is it sensible to think that they're actually able to hone in on a particular parameter of a sound when they're recognising mates or individuals of the same species or or uh, group members for example or is it more likely that they're recognizing the whole sound structure overall um, if you think about how you recognize the sounds of individuals that you know or are familiar with it's probably more like that you're recognizing the, the whole sound um, overall so really that's maybe what we want to try and do rather than isolating these parameters um, and, and just looking at a couple of them so is there a way that we can do that? Um, well, yes, that's what this, this discussion is about. So there's a few different ways that we can do this. The first is um, something called cross-correlation, which you may have heard of before. It's, it's a, a, a widely used technique, not just in biology, but in all sorts of fields. And it's simply a way to um, track similarity of, of variables or factors over time. So it's a technique borrowed from time series um, analysis or time series data. And you can see how well two, two time series match. To illustrate this as an example, it's actually widely used in, in economics um, and in stock markets to assess how well stocks are doing against um, the value of, of the great year. So you've got your, your asset, asset values here and how well does that match um, um, the, the value. Um, I hope you can still hear me uh, okay. I think my internet connection went a bit funny there. Um, yes, it's fine, we can still hear you, keep going. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Um, so another example might be something that you might be more familiar with. So visitors at Yellowstone Park, for example, um, how many visitors do you get at different months of the year and how much and how warm it is at different times of the year? Not surprisingly, you get tend to get more visitors when it's when it's warmer. So ecologists have kind of it's maybe not surprising then that this technique has been borrowed by ecologists to assess similarity in biological sounds. And so the first example is something that's called spectrographic uh, cross correlation. So if we take this rather simple uh, sonogram here of this rather simple bird sound, and say we have this sound and we want to compare it to a second one. So we have these two sounds here and we want to compare them. Effectively, what this technique does is it slides this, these sounds over the top of each other and compares them as um, points and takes a measure of the amount of overlap at those points. And it uses this to create a matrix. So the amount of overlap at each of these points is then summed to create this peak coefficient value along the diagonal of that matrix there. So if the two signals are very similar, 
then they should overlap considerably and you'll get quite a high FCC value. Now it's been realized for quite some time that this algorithm isn't very accurate. It doesn't really detect minor deviations and subtle complexities between um, sounds. So it's quite good for simple sounds and less so for complex ones. It's also quite sensitive to background noise. So if you have quite a lot of background noise in your, your, son, in your sonograms, then SCC doesn't tend to work as well. And it doesn't really cope very well if these signals aren't closely aligned. Them, the, the algorithm doesn't really deal with that very, very well. So this brings me to the next technique that we use, which is something called dynamic time warping. And this is also borrowed from time series analysis. So this is not a technique that's specific to ecology or, or biology either, but it's a dynamic program, programming technique um, that actually measures how uh, dissimilar two signals are. So dynamic time warping sounds a bit like something from Donnie Darko, but what it actually means is you're asking how much warping needs to be done to get these two signals to match one another. And because it's measuring the amount of difference or distance rather than the amount of similarity, it's actually able um, to detect these uh, minor variations um, a bit better. So we still overlap the signals, but it's about how much warping that, uh, there is to match. So it's got higher sensitivity to these variations. It can also account quite well for this signal distortion that I was um, uh, summed or, or, or collected to get that overall value. So rather than going just along the diagonal of the matrix, as with the SCC technique, the dynamic algorithm actually finds the most efficient pathway through this matrix. So if you see here, it will start in the same place as the SCC, so the first point of, of alignment and uh, on the two signals. But rather than just going along the diagonal, it will look to the cell directly below and directly to the right as well and select the lowest value out of each of those options. And it will do that all through the matrix. Um, and that's what we mean when we say finding the most efficient pathway. So as you can see in the figure here, it looks like it's that signals warping a bit. It's finding the best way to make those alignments to get the best measure of similarity overall. So if we put our sonograms back on here, just to illustrate that a little bit better, it's dealing with that distortion. And it's basically for this uh, sonogram here on the left that looks a bit stretched, it's basically uh, dealing with that distortion before it then compares the two sounds together. There's loads of different uh, software programs and, and um, um, that have uh, dynamic time warping implemented in it. So there's some R packages that are really useful and also some other acoustic software that you may be familiar with. These are just mostly ornithology based ones, but I'm sure there's others as well for the taxa. I'm going to talk to you now about a very specific uh, program that I've used in the past, which I find really useful. And I'm going to illustrate that with a specific example of some work I did a few years ago. So I'd like to introduce you uh, to this bird here. I'm sure you're all familiar um, with this bird. I hope the video is working. Um, you can see that. So this is the long-tailed tit. Um, I'm sure you'll agree long-tailed tits are one of the most cutest birds in the UK. They're also one of the smallest. Um, lots of fascinating things I could talk to you for hours about these birds. But the thing that interests me is that they're cooperative um, breeders. So this means that they have um, a mother and a father feeding the chicks when the, when the chicks are um, uh, uh, this age here or, um, and um, being fed very frequently by the parents here. But you also have what we call helpers at the nest. So you have these birds that if their own reproductive attempt fails and it's getting late into the breeding season and they don't have time to build a new nest, lay, lay eggs, incubate the eggs um, and then feed the chicks, Instead, one or both of those breeders will go and find a close relative somewhere in the breeding season and go and help them rare chicks instead. It's like the best of a strategy. So this behavior is really, really interesting. The question I have is how do those helpers And as this is an acoustic talk, 
you can imagine that the idea that we had is that they're actually um, using vocalizations to do this. Um, so, so I spent about four years of my life chasing long-tailed tits around the Peak District and trying to record the calls of as many individuals as I possibly could um, to answer this question. And I compared the, uh, the calls of these birds in a program called Lucinia. Lucinia is a really useful um, program. It's somewhere where you can store, analyze, and measure these recordings all in the same place. So you're not dipping between different packages and different software to do these different things. It was developed by Dr. Robert Lachlan at Royal Holloway um, University of London. And um, you can see here that this is the, the one of the calls of the, the long-tailed tips that I use, this, this chur call. I'll, I'll play it here. I hope, hopefully you can hear it. So it's a very, you've probably heard these all the time. Long-tailed tits are really, really noisy. It's, they're great birds to study this because they're so noisy. Um, and you can see here that I've taken these uh, measurements in uh, the software here. So you can tell Lucinia which, which parts of the sonogram you want to include for the analysis. So this is good if you have lots of background noise and you want to tell the program not to include this. And you can also tell the program how you want to split these calls into um, syllables and phrases. Um, if you want to sort of look at sort of the different hierarchical structures of the sounds as well. So it's really useful um, for, for sort of storing and, and taking these kind of measurements. The really good thing about it as well is that it just stores all of this information in a library and you can access this locally or over a network. So if you have collaborative, if you have collaborators working on different projects, you can all have access to this the, the measurements have been taken, they're stored in the library, you only have to do that once and then you've got that data in that library then that you can go back to and run different types of analysis on it and, and everyone's got access to the same thing. So I have some folders here of, of different uh, long-tailed tits and I've taken several recordings of calls um, of each individual. But you can also record location, so you can then go back and look at comparing at the individual level, um, at the population level, the species level, because you've got all that information stored there. So at the click of a button, you can decide at what level of, of comparison you want to make um, with this data. And then you can record lots of useful met metadata as well, like the recording equipment that you used and, and stuff like that. It's really useful. Um, you, can, you also have a lot of flexibility about how you actually want um, this program to run. So I talked before about just selecting parameters might not be super useful, um, but when you're doing something like the di dynamic time warping analysis, you might already have some information about the species that makes you want to weight certain parameters more than others when you do this analysis. And so there's options here in the there as well to be able to weight these parameters differently um, in the algorithm. One of the interesting things that is in Lucinia that I, I haven't always seen in other software too is that you can actually use um, frequency change as a parameter to use in your algorithms. And this is trying to really get at that what I was saying about the overall structure or the overall shape of that sonogram. Because if you're taking measurements at different points along the sound, and you're looking at the change in frequency in those different points, then that really starts to build a picture of what that sound actually looks like on the sonogram. So that's really useful as well. And so you can produce a dendrogram like this, which show you the different cl cluster, the different calls together based on how similar they are. And you can produce lots of really nice images um, to visualize uh, how, you, how these calls have been grouped together. And as I said, you can choose what level you want to make these comparisons with. So you can make comparisons at the, this is um, an example here where the program has done quite a good job at grouping songs or calls made by the same individual together, uh, which is useful. Um, but then also at the individual level as well. So which individuals are sounding more similar to one another. And you can also do this at the population level and at the species level. As I said, it's just a click of a button and you can decide what level you want to make that comparison. So what did this mean for long-tailed tits? Um, well, as I said, the dendrograms did a pretty good job at grouping relative 
together so relatives do sound more similar which is good and we also showed that those helpers do seem to choose um breeders that sound more similar to them when they when they have a nest fail so if they have a nest fail they tend to choose um to help at a nest of of, of breeders that sound more similar to them um, just shown by this this graph here so the observed um call dissimilarity because remember dtw is looking at dissimilarity um, so lower dissimilarity meaning calls are more similar um, than you would expect if these helpers are just choosing randomly in the population um, where to help so there are some challenges with species specific monitoring and this is kind of really going to open it up to the discussion now about some of these things that we might want want to talk about so the first thing is really the data collection itself. It's, in, it's very intensive and time consuming, um, chasing long tail tits around um, with a handheld microphone or trying to record calls. The equipment itself can also be um, expensive. The second is data processing. So streaming through hours and hours of audio files to isolate calls, um, the calls of interest, take those measurements, um, again, is, is a real challenge with this kind of analysis. So some of the solutions that are already sort of out there, you've probably already heard of, of passive acoustic devices like audio moths. Audio moths are a really good one. They're quite cheap. They're really small and compact. Um, you can set them up and um, it can they can record for as long as you want them to. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're really, really easy to distribute. And there's also lots of papers now about um, automating this process of ident identifying the songs that you need so <coughs> excuse me if you have a more audio moth up there it's just going to record everything and then there's sort of machine learning techniques where you can train um, computer programs to identify the calls of different species um, for further analysis and as a kind of side but i thought this was quite interesting this also um, is really good for citizen science projects you can dish out audio moths and you can use um, things like um, the BirdNet app if any of you have heard of this or, or use this is, it's a bit like Shazam the um, song app for birds so you can use the app to identify bird sounds that uses machine learning in the same way as, as some of these other um, papers have shown so it's a really good tool for citizen science as well but it's still and I think now um, what is even sort of in the pipeline is even taking this a step further and through the use of uh, Raspberry Pi, so these really, really small um, computers, you can actually install the training software onto those computers um, to identify the songs of the that you want to record and then attach those to the audio as well. I mean, this is still being developed as far as I'm aware. I don't think it's ready yet. But this means that you could in the, technically put the audio moth out there and it would only download onto the SD card the songs or sounds of the species that you actually train or tell that audio moth to record. So it saves a lot of um, space on the SD cards and um, a lot of the downstream programming as well. Um, so I'd like to finish there. Hopefully that didn't go um, too much over because I think this is a really good time to open up the discussion to talk about how some of these newer techniques can, can be applied to um, measures of acoustic similarity and also just open it up to other taxa and, and other sort of systems that you think this might be useful for. Um, I've just got a final acknowledgement slide. So uh, Professor Ben Hatchwell at the University of Sheffield is who I worked with on the Long Tail Tip project. And of course, Robert Lachlan, who developed the Lucinia software program um, for which I uh, used and have talked about a lot today um okay so thank you thanks for listening and um, let's open it up for discussion thank you very much amy that was absolutely fascinating um we don't have any questions in the chat at the moment um so um can i ask a question sure yep I mean, I've for a long time, I've been um, concerned about reintroduction projects from um, my, my knowledge of, for example, different races of birds and different dialects. 
So, um, for example, continental blackbirds are um, yeah, not necessarily similar in behaviour to our native blackbirds. And I think there has been work done, I can't remember who did it, on, on different, different dialects. Do you think that um, we are paying enough attention to the compatibility, acoustic, if you like, language um, and behavioural um, compatibility, if you like, when we're thinking about, for example, reintroducing um, birds and and also I could I could expand on this into vertebrates but let's leave it with birds at the moment yeah that's a really interesting point and a really good question yeah I think the answer is I mean we could pay more attention to it I think I mean it's certainly true there are studies that have shown that birds do have uh, local dialects and regional dialects and it's you know bird song is learned and, and it's I don't know how, how this compares to maybe other systems as well. So because it's learned, then you obviously do get regional differences in, in song. And if you're reintroducing species and they're... the other thing about if you're, you know, if males and females are using song to find mates and, and have successful um, breeding partners, then there is a question of compatibility there. I think if you're if you're um, reintroducing males that sing slightly differently to the local population, are females going to recognise them as the same species or going to prefer the males, the the local males, if you like? So I think that's certainly a question that mm. needs looking at. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very interesting um, area for research. And as I said, I've I've worried about this for a long time. Um, just you know you you hear about reintroductions that are not successful um despite many things being taken into account but i have never read about that um acoustic or or behavioral compatibility because we don't we don't necessarily understand what what is involved in mate selection um, we now have a question. Um, um, we've now got several questions, which is great. Um, what about mimics, birds that mimic other birds? How does that affect? Um, yeah, so you do certainly Studies. get a, um, a lot of um, bird mimics. I mean, there's there are, and there's big papers to look at. It kind of ties in between both of those topics, I think, that there's, um, I think it was a, the pink pigeon in Mauritius, and I, I can't remember the other sp species now, but there's an introduced species and it sounds so similar that the females are actually getting confused and going for the wrong male, and then they're actually incompatible. So it's actually reducing the populations there because they're choosing the wrong male because they sound so similar. So that's certainly a, a problem to do with sort of mating and reproductive behaviour. Uh -huh. um, so they're actually choosing a male of the wrong species. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, it, that's it was... even worse than what I was imagining, which is that they just <laughs> would not be able to get it together because they couldn't speak the same language. Um, oh, that's really interesting. That's that's deeply worrying, actually. Um, yeah. But, um, the question was specifically asking about how does that mess up the machine learning ah right okay yeah i mean this is this is i think an interesting discussion to have because how i mean these these machine learning learning techniques are are getting better and better all the time but they're certainly not perfect so i think if you do have either species that have a really really large repertoire or um, you have very species that sound very very similar and mimics then it's likely that if it's a really good mimic i don't know i, I doubt that uh, some of the, the machine learning algorithms would be able to tell the difference i mean it's a really it's a really important point to consider if you're setting up your devices in areas where there are mimics and you're using machine learning to to 
label and, and identify different species, I think it's something that would need considering. Hmm. There's another question here, which is um, a comment that it was really interesting, but it'd be great to know uh, of any correlations you've been looking at to illustrate a sense of information transfer beyond advertising and deterrence. Um, I'm not sure if I understand. Uh, you mean sort of other, other uses for acoustics within within T T I who posed that question would you like to unmute yourself and ask that question directly and explain what you mean because I I read that as you know birds advertising their presence or or deterring competitors could you unmute yourself be not yeah okay let's I, move I on i can't see that question in the chat but um, okay. i'm not sure whether um some people might be replying directly to me rather than oh, I see. for everyone so it's it's yeah um the next question is do you know whether bird observatories are using acoustic technology to record bird species migrating over at night um the answer is i don't know i think um i know that the ac acoustics is is more and more um, at the moment to monitor species but i i wouldn't be able to tell you whether or not that's something that that's being done. No, I I don't know that either. I mean I Fair Isle was an example. Hmm. And how does acoustic uh, measurement dealing with, deal with noise pollution? And does acoustic measurement notice any change in animal bird acoustics in response to noise pollution? certainly had changes yes. with light pollution haven't we yes there's a lot of research on the effect of um anthropogenic noise on birds and, and bird populations um so um you know there's there's a whole field of research dedicated to this and it is it's definitely something that um is a problem for birds so birds in in um, urban areas can have been shown to sing at higher frequencies um, to try and um, out um, out compete with with background noise or or anthropogenic noise, which tends to be sort of lower frequency, sort of traffic noise and sort of rumbling. So some species have have started to sing at higher frequencies to try and be heard over that noise. Um, but there's also been studies to show that um, there's been changes in in birds singing at different times of, of day to compete compete with sort of traffic noise, so to traffic noise and this kind of there's loads and loads of really, really good studies on the effects of, of anthropogenic noise on birds, but the short answer is that it definitely has an effect. Um, right, P.I. can't unmute. I've tried to um, mute him, I can't. He says he was actually asking what cross correlations fascinate Amy the most, having seen the potential of machine learning to cluster. Um, so I've used cross correlation really just to compare individuals of the same species. So most of my experience comes with a single bird species, which is long-tailed tits. Um, so I can tell you that, you know, the information that I talked about here about the, um, you know, how related individuals are sounding more similar. I mean, that's pretty fascinating to me. But beyond that, uh, I, I, I'm i not sure if that's what you're asking, whether you're asking if, if I've looked at correlations between other species or um something else so maybe you can unmute and, and ask me if i've answered your question very well, well or not probably not <laughs> no i'm not sure why he can't unmute 
I don't think I can unmute everyone in the tried to unmute him. Um, Simon Geary has said that Portland OBS has been recording. Um, Simon, do you know what sort of results they've had? If you can unmute. Maybe nobody can unmute. No, surely people are. Um, I'm unmuted. Is that audible? Excellent. Excellent. I'll Ask your question you then. Question? I did have a question. Okay. How do you get from the SD card to sonograms and indices? I know it's probably a fairly simple step-by-step -step process, but. Um, so do you mean, how do I get from the SD card to? Well, once you have your SD card from the audio model. How do you get the information from the SD yeah, card? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. put the, in, the SD card into a um, reader, is that right? Plug yeah, it into Yeah, so you can get, um, you can put, yeah, you can plug it into your laptop and then you would normally save um, the data from the SD card as, as WAV files, WAV files is what right. I've used and I think is what most programs use. So, for example, in Lucinia, you would um, go through the, the WAV files and isolate those calls that you're interested in and then feed them into the Lucinia program. But there's also a lot of um, programs in R now, so I think C-WAV, um, Warble R is the one that I um, showed on the screen there, where you can actually just read in the WAV files directly into R and actually perform these functions in R directly on those WAV files. Um, so, I mean, there's some techniques where you don't even have to yeah. open the sound files and look at them but to would do Kaleidoscope, that. Would Kaleidoscope do that job? So I haven't used Kaleidoscope, but yes, I think that's another, yeah, I think that's a pretty good program for labeling, um, labeling different sounds. So um, I, yeah, as I said, I haven't used it myself, but I am, I know of it. And I think that's a pretty good program for, for that kind of thing. Yeah. It's used quite a lot for bat work, isn't it? Yes, it is. I have heard it uh, through through back colleagues that have used kaleidoscope. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I once had a student who compared different programs for analysing back calls, but I can't remember what the result was. It's what came up best, and it changes all the time. Um, no, Drew I'll has asked. It out one way or the other. Uh, um, how much does acoustic recording equipment typically cost? Uh, you said that the audio moths were cheap. Cheap is a relative. Um... Yes, true. So I think the audio moths you can buy for about £30 each. Um, and um, so the handheld microphone that I've used can be anything from £1,000 upwards. There are so audio moths are kind of on the cheap side for acu uh, passive acoustic devices um you can get others that are maybe between four or five hundred pounds but it does really vary i mean it massively varies depending on on the 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 makes and models that you go for but that's i think that's one of the really good things about audio moth is that they are as far as i'm aware i haven't seen any that, that are cheaper than that so you can buy and deploy a lot to sort of if you're interested in particular if you want to do a survey on an area, you can deploy quite a lot of audio moths um, in an area and get a really sort of um, good measure of, of um, acoustic mm. data. There, so. And um, yeah, the, the further question on that is, um, oh, um, is what about weather and um, temperature and wind, for example? Um, and someone's commented that audio moths make waterproof models as well for amphibians, etc. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so for terrestrial recording, wind is is definitely a problem. Um, it can be difficult. The the audio moths that you um, deploy do have cases that 
provide some protection. But yeah, the hydro moths are um, the the audio moths that are used to, for underwater recording as well. So hydro moths, they're called, and they're specifically for, um, as you say, uh, underwater uh, passive acoustic recording. And and weather conditions affect behaviour anyway. So if you've got high wind, you're probably not going to be getting the kind of behaviour you want to record anyway. So. It's Exactly. So, I mean, it's as for my experience because I was I didn't use passive devices for this particular project that I was talking about here. I was using handheld mics, and it was kind of fair weather field work. Really, we couldn't go out if it was really rainy or really windy because the birds wouldn't be doing anything. We wouldn't be able to capture any sound. So, yeah, I mean, these things do have an effect. Background noise as well. I mean, I didn't really talk too much about it, but it is. I mean, it's a real problem, and there are techniques and 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 pro and um algorithms to try and sort of deal with background noise on recordings and trying to remove background noise before analysis but it's really really difficult and it's a it's a big problem mm. and and presumably um the um the more you pay for your equipment the more likely you are to be able to get high quality recordings in adverse conditions uh, I, I suppose that's that's maybe true to some extent, but I think there's certain conditions where, I mean, I mean, there's only, you know, I think it's it's very difficult to have recordings where the, if you're out in in adverse weather conditions and where you're not going to have some background noise, um, it's it is a problem. But yeah, the directional microphones are are probably better for that so the the microphones that I use it looked like it's called a shotgun mic it, and you know you, you point it directly at the 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 bird or or the individual that you want to record they tend to be good if you if you if you're able to have spend the time doing that and going out and collecting the data because it's it's directional and so it does remove some of the background noise more than say an audio moth would that you would deploy and just leave it out there mm. Okay, we're not getting any more questions in the chat, so maybe I can ask another one before um, we begin to wrap up. And, and that is, um, again, I'm afraid it's my concerns about um, reintroductions of using animals from different places. Um, how about um, mammals? For example, the uh, dormouse introduction schemes, um, I'm, I'm well aware that they, um, they can pair up individuals from populations, for example, from uh, Devon and Kent. And it's always worried me that there might be behavioural and, um, and acoustic differences between those, those animals which might make you know, breeding um, difficult, this incompatibility. Um, I, I don't know, has anybody done any work on that? It would be a very interesting area of research with some of these um, these rarer, more vulnerable, protected species. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would be. It's just would be really interesting to find out at what kind of scale these differences in in um, these sort of dialects exist at. So is is you know, is something the distance between Cornwall and Devil Devon? Would you see um, differences at that scale? And sorry, I don't I said know. Kent, Kent and Devon. Oh, sorry, Kent so, and Devon. You know, I mean, those populations would have been. I mean, I to me, for a small mammal, that's pretty widely separated. Yeah, for sure, and it, I guess it would depend on taxa as as well when you're thinking about how how far these populations disperse. So I think it's, I, I think it's, as I said, it's just a relatively understudied area. Most of my knowledge comes from birds and I know they've looked at sort of larger scale differences. So differences in dialects between sort of, you know, countries in Europe, for example, rather than sort of within the UK. But that's not to say there hasn't been any studies on there. I'm just not as aware of them as, as I am with sort of more larger scale vocal dialects. But I think it is a really important thing to start considering to see how, you know, how small scale are these differences in dialects and, and would mm. they start to have an effect? Definitely. Well, speak and talk about the dormice issue. Um, 
yeah, offline. Um, Henrietta has put in the um, in the chat that if you're interested in doing your own recording, BTO has a useful guide and has given the uh, the link, so um, everyone can get that link out of the chat. Um, and this will be the last question because it's ten to seven, and we have to wrap up by seven. In your long tail tit study, were you able to conform that helpers confirm that helpers that sounded similar to parents were indeed more closely related to them? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, and and yes, we were. So we had um, we do uh, genotyping on the birds as well. So when we put the colour rings on, we also take a, a DNA sample. So we have a, a pedigree um, of of these birds. So all of all the birds have we recorded we know who's related to who and we have all of that information and, and yes it did seem that these birds that were were helping those individuals that sounded more similar to them were also more closely related to them as well so it's normally a, a brother or um it's normally a brother of the breeding male that, that tends to be Right, you see, I'd assumed that you were colouring in so that you could identify individuals, but maybe that wasn't obvious to everyone. You've, you've frozen, Amy. So, sorry, I probably didn't say that, and maybe I, I skipped over that too quickly. Yes, I, I mean, I'm saying I assumed that uh, because I know uh, that's hello? how you do it. Am I un unfrozen? You yes, you are me? unfrozen. You're a bit. Yes, I think there's something a bit odd about your sound. Could you stop sharing, Amy, please? That's it. So I can share my screen and. Helps. Um, but yes, the answer is is yes and we do we colouring the individuals right so i've just got a couple of things to mention in the last few minutes um if you can see my slides yes, yes. we can see those you can only see the first one and i'm here so I just wanted to raise awareness um, for those of you who are um, lecturing um, that the entries are now open for the um, SAIM Higher Education Programme Award, um, which is a really valuable opportunity for um, institutions to raise awareness of their particular programme and looking at um, how they're increasing um, employability opportunities for um, for their students and it might be even more relevant to mention the SAIM Postgraduate Student Award um, sponsored by Santec because we do have some um, we know we've got some students here um, the winner gets a £250 check and if you are um, particularly proud of your dissertation, please submit it uh, for this award. And equally, if you're lecturing and you have students who have uh, done a particularly good um, postgraduate dissertation, so this is for master's students, not, not undergrads, uh, please do put it in. The closing date is um, 21st of November. So there is plenty of time um, to get your um, your entry in, and if you uh, you don't have to be a SAIM member for either of these awards, they're open to anyone. Obviously, on the subject of ecology, but an environmental management. Um, so it'd be great if we had some more entries for both of these. Um, and the next two events we've got on the 20th of October, we have um, issues in ecological fieldwork. Now this is the um, looking at the guidelines that the Royal Geographical Society have, um, 
have made in they did a really wide consultation um, around people um, input from lots of different places into this and it's it's looking about all sorts of issues that we don't always take into account like um, accessibility diversity issues um, and and physical and mental well-being in field work um, all those wider issues that um, might be affecting um, the ways in which people respond to field work, which I'm sure we all feel is a very, very important issue. So what we're really looking at there is how can um, the ecological and environmental management sector in their field work learn from what um, learn from what um, has been being, going on in the um, in the geographical and earth science area. And on the 17th of November, uh, we have someone speaking about the use of drones in ecological surveying. Um, again, this is um, particularly the, um, new area for lots of, um, lots of working. So if you are a member of SIEM, um, do sign up to the academic special interest group um, because that will ensure that you um, hear about all our events. And even if you aren't a member of SIEM, you should get a copy of the um, newsletter, which comes out every term. The next one's due out in January, which will um, tell you about issues of interest in this area and raise awareness of events. Does anyone have any final questions? Just have a quick look at the chat again. I think, Amy, you can probably see how many thanks you're getting in the chat. And people Thank saying you. it's a great talk. So thanks a lot, Amy, um, from, from me as well. And um, yeah and, and that's it and hope to see you all at the next absolutely the next thank talk you very much. thank you very much for for having me it's been great thanks very much thanks amy okay i'll stop sharing my screen and thank you, good night everyone thank you God bless. and i have to remember to stop recording oh yes <laughs> If you just hang about for a minute, um,